dear baby It's been a long, long I heard you were back in the village. Will you stay for a little while? This is Omar Dede. Welcome to a great program. This is what we call the spotlight of the month. The hope and inspirational story of young Africans making big mark in their career, in every area they choose to venture into in life. And today we are here with CEO woman who has been able to create her own word, Shelley. I absolutely um, was inspired by your story. I was, I was reminded why I'm doing what I'm doing every day. I do what I do because of women like you. So tell us, who is Shell? Tell us. Who is Shells? <laughs> so my name is actually Shelley and my friends call me Shells. And so who am I? Oh my God, that's a, that's a very uh, big question. So um, I'm originally uh, from Nigeria. Uh, I grew up in Nigeria, but um, I was born here in the U.S. And uh, my parents went to college here. And after college, they relocated back uh, to uh, Nigeria. So I have to say that a lot of who I am, I am right now as a grown up, uh, a lot of that uh, was inspired and imbibed as a young girl growing up uh, in Nigeria, West Africa. So I, uh, I'm a second child uh, in a family of five siblings. I have uh, three brothers and a sister. Um, my parents are both Nigerians as well. Um, and my mom is an economist, my dad is an engineer, so uh, they're pretty, uh, very uh, high standards that they set for us uh, growing up. And uh, I was just a, a normal African girl growing up, soaking up every uh, little thing uh, in my environment, growing up from styles to language to culture to uh, good behavior, bad behavior. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of like from a where are you from perspective. That's kind of like a nutshell general answer to that. But uh, I don't know how I begin to answer a question about who where did this talent come from? How did it start? It's interesting that you call it a, a talent, but I guess that's a compliment. But I think my stylistic instincts uh, really started uh, in Africa. And uh, I would say I have a very good eye for colors. I do, I do appreciate colors. And uh, obviously the, the Ankara print is really the epitome of color. When you're talking about colorful vibrant fabric, the Ankara fabric has to really be the number one on that list. So growing up uh, back in Nigeria, the Ankara print of fabric is really, everybody wears that from old to young. But I think there was an era, I want to say maybe mid, mid 80s to mid 90s, where I think the Ankara fabric sort of uh, went from uh, a Thai kind of wrapper thing to uh, a more sophisticated uh, attire, stylistically. So I would remember my mom would um, use Ankara's. My mom actually is an economist and she worked for the UN. And you're supposed to dress very professionally uh, in the UN. And she would use these Ankara fabrics to really sew very wonderful double-breasted suits with pencil skirts. And one time I think she, she didn't really have any English suit. Everything she had was uh, Ankara. So I thought that was... so. Uh, I did. I remember that era very, very well. I, it, it just wasn't her that, who was doing that. I think I saw a lot of sophisticated women as well in the corporate world in Nigeria doing that as well. So I think I was inspired from the perspective that we can take this fabric to another level stylistically. But I think what we've done with Shell's Bells is not just to elevate it style-wise, but to really elevated from a fabric perspective. So when you think about Ankara, you think about you think about cotton, right? So what we've done is to say, hey, if you want to get Ankara print on any other kind of fabric, you can, and we can make that happen. And I think that's what we did with Shell's Bell. So if you look here, for example, this is a, the Ankara print, and this is a sequin. So I'm not, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the sequin fabric. So sequin is very 
it's a very expensive sort of luxuriant type fabric so i think what we've done with shells bells is to really give people the flexibility to really say well i want a taffeta i want a, a christmas dress but i don't want it to be in cotton you would hardly see a christmas dress that is in cotton so i think for us to satisfy the kinds of needs that we have here in the west stylistically and seasonally as well i think we had we really had to elevate the ankara fabric you know as a small town girl growing up in nigeria like myself um we go th we go through a lot of challenges in life you know and because there's so much so many things we don't re we are not really exposed to mm -hmm. when it comes to being in nigeria and mm -hmm. everything and you have come to America. You have been able to establish yourself right here. So I want I want to know when you were coming from Nigeria. Did you did you have this vision? Was it part of your plan? And how did this whole thing come about of having your own line? What are the struggles that you have, you know, overcome? So I think uh, I'm guessing that most of your audience are Africans, and I'm also hoping that you you have other audiences audiences as well that are beyond uh, Africans, but. If you grew up in Nigeria or any other African country, I think uh, your parents sort of like in your ears, you have to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer or something. So I think I, I grew up just really having that at the back of my head that for me to be anybody, for my parents to be proud of me, I have to be a professional. So when, when my parents decided it was time for me to come back to the United States to uh, continue my education, Obviously, it, it was, you have to be this. I mean, I think you only had five things on that list, really. And you really had to choose one. So I don't think that when I came here, I, I, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to think about the things that I enjoy doing, the things that really make my eyes sparkle. I think I came here saying I was going to get an education. I was going to get a very superb education. And I was going to study what my dad wanted me to study, which was uh, it's either you're a doctor or a pharmacist, uh, and that's it. And I went ahead and I went to uh, pharmacy school. I went as high as a doctorate level uh, in pharmacy. And beyond that, I've gone back to school as well to continue to really uh, uh, extend myself in that area. So uh, the truth is that I, I didn't have that at my head coming coming here but it, it's always lingered when I watch TV shows or when I look at fashion week and see the models you know I sort of daydream but uh, part of the hindrances as well is that you know you have all these real life things that are happening that really distract you from that so I have to say that I came to the point in my life where it was a combination of an opportunity that really allowed me to uh, sort of push back a lot of the things that I focused on in the past uh, 15 years or so to really say, okay, this is the time to do that. I know you talked about your mom uh, all the time, how she made a car, a dress for you with a car. So, how has that influenced your work with Shields Bells? Yeah, so I grew up not, you know, I, I guess when I when I moved here to the United States, uh, the idea of custom-made clothes is considered like upper-class stuff. Like mm -hmm. for you to have a tailor, tailor make your outfits means that, uh, oh, you're rich or you're wealthy. But that's how I grew up. Everything that I wore was custom-made. So we had tailors that would come to the house and measure everybody, literally every three to six months because we were growing very quickly. So everything from Easter to Christmas to weddings, to literally everything, church, we had our outfits custom made. So the idea of that wasn't quite novel to me. So when I had my daughters, obviously I was just too excited to have girls to dress up. And it wasn't hard for me to look for ways to custom make the things that I like to do. And I would go as far as New York, Connecticut, Virginia to find a tailor who would sew stuff. And I think a lot of the folks around me thought that was a little extreme, but I thought it was normal to do that. I just didn't have them around me in Philadelphia to say, all right, come to my house to get this done. But I started custom making my baby's clothes like when they were like six months, nine months. Because, like I said, I, I think the idea of vibrancy and color was something that really... Uh, drew of my stylistic instinct and I didn't really see that like in the grays and the whites and the reds you know I wanted like the hot pinks I wanted like fuchsia all over mixed with greens and stuff like that and I had to go find those fabric myself and you know custom make it I want our, our audience to see what we are talking about and uh, 
Because these are, these are things you normally, these are things that you normally see when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. You see in um, what we normally call the American or the mm -hmm. English way, you know? Yeah. So tell us, tell us this. I want to know <laughs> how you came about. These are some of the pieces. <laughs> tell me, what, what is the I most, like um, this one. I like that. what is the most fun for, of all the dresses you have made? Because I want them to see what you have done. I think uh, I, I would first of all say that. <laughs> so the, the 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 biggest thing here, the first thing that you see is color. So mm -hmm. I keep going back to color. So color before style, right? So I spend a lot of time actually custom uh, design the prints myself. I do have uh, vendors that have softwares that they've been kind enough to lend to me to say. You can play around with the colors, you can move the hearses around, you can make them yellow, you can shrink them, you can explode them. So I think that part of it was fun for me and picking the colors as well. From a style perspective, like you said, you, you use the word English. Yeah. I, I think we've kept the styles very Western, very yeah. simple, very elegant and very uh, classy. I think I've had some of my uh, friends that I grew up with call me and say, oh, you can make this a little bit more stylish, you can be you know, off shoulder a little bit. I said no. Stylistically, I think uh, because we really wanted to elevate the Ankara into mainstream America. So we were very careful to make sure that we were merging some of the appeal, the Western appeal, to uh, the African Ankara appeal. So from a stylistic perspective, I would say, I mean, this is, this is the typical, like, going to church. Mm -hmm. You know, render, and I, I've been. Uh, I I have a very good eye for really paying attention to the kinds of fabrics that I use beyond the Ankara. So even when we're trying to accent a dress, we still try to stay on that same theme. So I use the organzers, I use uh, the taffeters to do any kinds of accent. So um, this is a uh, this one I think that you you mentioned about liking. I think I really like this because this yeah. is a like a peplum yeah. <laughs> type wear. So this is like a little shicky uh, girl trying to be a little grown up, but it is cutesy. We made the peplum a little bit more uh, playful and uh, elaborate, just not to be so serious. But uh, I think when you see this, the the first thing that pops out is the print and the color. Before I think before the style. And we've really tried. I, I, I don't think that you can take the business of the Ankara print and the vibrancy of it and try to be to go crazy with the style. So we have sort of uh, kept it a little toned down. It reminds me of growing up. Mm -hmm. It gives me the sense of um, culture. You know, this is mine. This yeah. is my. I have I have a very soft spot for Ankara. I love it. So we have obviously. Um, I think when we when we started, we, we focused so much on uh, trying to get the prints right. I didn't think I was going to have a, a challenge with finding, uh, you know, folks or tailors who can uh, sew this stuff. So um, what 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 I really do in terms of how the business is modeled is, I I am the person who designs the prints. I come up with the concepts, the patterns, the sketches. And I really think the tailor really comes in at the back end, and it's been a challenge. I think sometimes it's one of the challenges that you face when you design these things is being able to transmit that vision to uh, to the seamstress or, or to the tailor or to whoever the workers are. But I think we've been uh, lucky enough to uh, find folks who really uh, are in sync with uh, my ideas and my concepts, and we've uh, we've we've had a we've had we have a handful of tailors who uh, work for us uh, here in the area uh, local locally, because we really wanted to keep uh, the business local as well, and they really do a, a great job uh, in bringing these things that you see here to life. Has it been when it comes to the African community and with your with your line? Have they been happy because? So many times the always the complaint we always hear when it comes to people trying to do uh, what they need to do in life people trying to get ahead the African community we are known for that I'm saying it because I want um, the African community to come together and we we all need to start supporting what we all we, we do mm -hmm. has it been the, the, the reception from the African community I think uh, I, I want to say really that we've had a, a good reception and uh, I think uh, I, w I want to take a little bit of a credit for that because yeah. uh, it was something that I carefully choreographed 
So when we when we started, I mean, one of the things that you hear growing up is that charity begins at, at home. So I think when I was thinking about the concept of the, of the business, the strategy, who we wanted to market to, who we wanted to appeal to, the objective was to really appeal to the West because I felt like uh, we Africans, we grew up wearing these things. We, so, this is like our underwear, like, you know, this yeah. is our napkin. Like, we yeah. know about it. So the, the major part of the business was to really relaunch the Ankara, introduce the Ankara into mainstream America. But at the same time, I think I was having this conversation with some of my business advisors and I said, I would like to apply that principle that charity begins at home. So one of the things that we did was to reach out to uh, African designers uh, in the East Coast and uh, we actually uh, did our maiden uh, showcase or lunch with an organization called um, a, a African Arts and Fashion Week uh, in DC. And that was really where you had really the who is who in African fashion and design come in. And I wanted them to critique it. I wanted to hear from them because I felt like if they sort of gave me their blessing that uh, things would work out well. I wanted to tap into their knowledge as African designers in diaspora as well. And I really wanted that red carpet welcoming to say, okay, while well, we support you, we like what, we, what you're doing, or we don't like what you're doing. So I think that strategy really worked out to really go to the African community first and say, before we launch, and this was in March, we launched in June, this is what we're doing, what do you think? And be honest, what do you really think? And also to be honest to them to say, this is really who we're targeting, but we still need to kind of get your blessing and I think that whole strategy really worked out because it was really our first showcase we got quite a, a lots of advice from uh, from them and uh, but I'll have to be honest to also say that uh, sometimes uh, you get all kinds of uh, opinions as well and I think that's where um, you really have to always go back and remember why you started what you started what your initial strategy is and sort of uh, pilot that ship and stay at course and uh, make sure that you're taking the kinds of advice that are, that are channeled uh, towards your strategy. So there are all, there are some, there were, there were more positives than negative and I think what we did was to focus uh, on, on the positives and I think the blessings and the, the gratitude that we got from the African community has really uh, brought us uh, a very, a very long distance. That is, that is what, basically, that is what African Connect is all about. We're trying to showcase the positive side of life of uh, women gaining grounds, whatever they are, in, in whatever um, businesses they're into. Mm -hmm. And you are doing an amazing, wonderful job with your brand. And uh, what, where do you see yourself? Where do you go from here now? Where do we go from here? So, I mean, first of all, let me just say that we have come so far and things have happened so quickly that sometimes I'm asking my, my, myself that same question, where are we going? Because it seems like if you're trying to travel from point A to point B, all of a sudden you find yourself in point K. So I think that's what has happened to us. And I think at this point we're trying to get back to point B and say, okay, are we trying to get a K or L or P? So that's where we are right now. So our original intention really was um, to really bring the African prince into the main fashion discourse of the West. And when I'm talking about the West, I'm talking about North America, I'm talking about uh, Europe, I'm talking about Canada. And I think at this point, I mean, it's quite early to say that, but I want to say based on the reception that we've gotten so far, that we've somehow put a dent uh, towards that goal. Uh, where do we continue to see ourselves? I think we, we want to continue what we're doing, which is to stay quality, which is to uh, continue to expand our base. I think when we started, we, we said we were, we're targeting, so based on our price point, I think we were very uh, myopic in our vision to say that we were going to target a certain demographic. I think I pulled my business hat on and said, you have to really define your demographic. You have to be very business and very methodical about how you target them. And that was what we did. But I think we missed the mark because when we went back to look at our analytics data, we were all wrong. We were wrong in terms of who was going to buy from us. Mm -hmm. We were wrong based on, on their income level. We were wrong in terms of where they lived. We were wrong in terms of their 
age group so it was interesting to go back and say wow we were so wrong on every front so we had to re-strategize and say okay how do we understand who is buying from us how do we understand what drives them how do we do that one of the things that we've done after our first launch is to uh, have what you call focus groups to have a group of moms uh, come together we didn't really handpick them we just kind of randomly uh, organize them and just talk about what they thought about the business, where they saw it, how much they're willing to spend, where, what kinds of occasion do they see these outfits uh, worth wearing to, and I think that kind of strategy where you 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 want to be open to changing course is really very important. And a good example to that is when we started, we I, I remember telling one of my friends that because we had many many people say you should go adult, 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 adult. And I said, I want to do children, 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 because I love children, I love little girls, I love to dress kids up, and I really wanted the passion to be intact. I didn't want to lose it by going into adults. But when we went back to look at our research, and we found out that a lot of the moms that were buying from us were a lot younger than we thought. We were thinking more mid-30s to mid-40s, and then grandmas who were buying for their granddaughters, but we really missed the mark, and we saw that a lot of these parents were very young, as young as 22, 21 years old, who were buying a bunch of 25, 26 year olds, a very, very young mommy, you know, population. And when we dug further, we, we realized that one of the things that appealed to the kinds of moms that have bought from us is, these are the moms that love to dress up their kids like me. I know some friends that don't really, they don't really care. I care a lot. So these are moms that they really love to dress up their kids. These moms like to match with their daughters as well. As well, if you can create a shop for them where they can buy one for their little girl and one for themselves, they will go crazy. And these are some of the insights that we got from you know really trying to understand who was buying from us. So we did something that was kind of outside our strategy to go adult. So this season, uh, fall winter couple weeks so this interview is quite timely we are coming out with uh, a mother daughter collection again me being a little conservative not to kind of go outside the window we're coming out with just two lines just to sort of see if we hit the sweet spot or not so uh, in a couple weeks I uh, will find out so as a mom you can go in and pick a, a skirt for yourself and, and you know pick something for your daughter and you guys can go all out because I know um, shells bills have just been picked up by the major um, retail store so tell us more about that yeah so i mean uh like i said uh the biggest vision that we had was uh to really get this into main street america and that is very very critical right and one of some of the challenges that we had was that the production of these garments are very expensive so it was really hard for us to really get it to a price point where it will be easily accessible to everybody but that has always been something that i, I felt it, it is worthless to have something that people don't have access to so e-commerce was a big 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 part of our strategy to say when you see it on a lookbook you can buy it because when you think about a lot of the ankara high fashion stuff you have loads of catalogs you have loads of lookbooks but then when you try to go to the website to buy it there is nothing. There's mm -hmm. no e-commerce. Yeah. It's like email us here if you want something, and that's kind of fresh. That's like, that's kind of like a bummer. So we started with a website where you can go see what you like. You drag it and put it in a cart. It gets shipped to you right away. And we also felt like because we were starting newly, we didn't really have the prowess and the infrastructure to really sort of bring our stuff e-commerce wise to Main Street. So we were looking for organizations that sort of have the same vision that we do have to appeal to the kinds of moms that we appeal to. And we found that in Zoomily. And um, initially I have to say that uh, when we approached Zulily with uh, our designs. Of course, being a small time person in little old Pennsylvania, we were confident in what we had, <laughs> but you know, Zulily has 10 million customers. In fact, in business world, uh, the term Zulily mom is actually uh, in, in the business dictionary because it's actually a particular demographic of women mm -hmm. who it's interesting who they are. These are women who, they're very, very frugal. They're cheap. Yes. They don't want to spend a lot of money, but guess what? They have some of the 
best, highest stylistic taste. instincts, yeah. taste, taste that you can ever imagine. So yeah. it's like a very weird combination of you really like good stuff, but you don't want to spend money. So, uh, and we knew our stuff was very good. We knew it was a little bit, you know, off price wise. So we felt like, hey, let's partner with Zulily and offer these moms a discount. It's a win-win situation. They get the, you know, the styles that they want. They get the elegance and the class, something new, something different and unique. And at the same time, we, we can partner with Zulily to bring it to them uh, in, a, with, in affordable prices. So that's how that happened. And I knew you were married, you mother of three kids. Mm -hmm. How's married life and um, being mother and now a CEO? How's that been? Like, how have you been able to manage the, the two, I would say the three? <laughs> it's been fun, actually. I mean, I'm lucky enough to, I had my first two kids with, with girls and my girls are like the classic girly girls. And when I shared my ideas with them, they were ecstatic about it. They were extremely supportive. They told the whole school. And when I showed up for my next conference, they're like, oh, we hear that you're trying to make them look okay. <laughs> so my family has been very supportive. Um, my husband has uh, been extremely uh, supportive, not necessarily from the stylistic perspective. <laughs> Because I, I show him certain things. I'm like, does this color match this color? And he would always say yes. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay. I just try to fool you to see if you really... I try to do a test and yeah. you fail. But uh, I would say the biggest support... How I mean, my mom would always say, uh, show me the money. Really, you follow the money. And I really think that he has shown his biggest support by, you know, showing us the money. He has uh, supported us financially. Uh, he hasn't asked too many questions about what happened to the last <laughs> that we gave you guys. <laughs> so uh, that has been really nice, just not being nervous, not feeling a lot of pressure. Because when you're starting something new, you make a lot of mistakes. So I've had that support. Uh, my family, my siblings, my brothers... You know, they've been really uh, wonderful. My, my parents, my dad is already retired, but I remember when we started and uh, <laughs> he would come, he would want to do quality checks. I mean, he's over 60 years old and he's just in there trying to really teach me uh, the ropes, how to deal with vendors. And he's, uh, he, brings in, he brings in some of that uh, business advice. My mom comes in from a very uh, spiritual, emotional support. And you know, hang in there. If this is what you're supposed to do, you you will succeed. Even if even if it doesn't work, but 20 years from now, you're never gonna look back and say, "Well, what if?" At least you eliminate that question for for you know from your addiction for the rest of your life because you know that well, it didn't work. And if if it works, then it, it's great. So I, I think the family side of thing has been uh, such a, a huge part of this story because. Uh, I don't know how you do it when you don't have that uh, support. So, if any girl or any boy, anybody that want to start a business or even even having the inspiration or even having it, aspiring to be a designer, what is your message to all the young girls, all the young boys coming from Africa, mm -hmm. even right here in Diaspora in, yeah. in Little Old Town, Pennsylvania? What is your uh, message to them? I guess, I mean, I don't want to limit my commentary to those who want to be designers. Mm -hmm. I, I think I would say anything really, whether it be that you want to sing or you want to act or you want to pursue a, a different uh, career. I, I think uh, my biggest advice is uh, to really uh, take it easy and slow. I, I think sometimes uh, the mistakes that are horrible mistakes that you don't even want to revisit and that idea happens when we rush or when we're very impulsive about any cute ideas that we have and that's number one and number two I, I talked about seeking buy-in from you know at least your close friends and your family mm -hmm. that's extremely important and um, I think uh, the other important aspect of it is really um, again this is more from a business perspective yeah. from a business side I mean this is pure business 101 you have to ask yourself, especially if, if you're bringing in a, a business or a product or a service, is how is it different? What's already there? Yeah. 
And I don't know that people do that because they just have this idea and to them it's novel. It's great, it's innovative. Nobody you know, I'm just thinking this in my in my bedroom and nobody else has done it before. But hey, maybe there are two hundred people somewhere doing it. So I don't I, I, I see that missing a lot, you know, in, in, in people in just having that uh, research done. So what's what's unique about your product? What's 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 different about it? Or how are you going to make it different? Because I think that's what sells. What sells is the innovativeness, the value. And uh, if I try to criticize myself when I, when I was trying to bring Ankara in, I asked myself that question. Ankara is quite ubiquitous here in the U.S. and the West. People have done quite a lot with Ankara. And I, I loved Ankara. So when I asked myself that same question, you want to work with Ankara in kids, but how is that different? Ankara, you know, people are working with Ankara mm -hmm. every day. And that was when I felt, you know what, we can elevate the fact we can make it more luxurious. I don't see a lot of people doing it. And we can do that. And I think that has really, that has made a difference in terms of uh, the success that we've had with the lunch. Um, the research that we've done to understand who we're marketing to, uh, the kinds of moms who are going to buy from us, what they want, and the styles that appeal to them, because honestly, they're different kinds. I've had, I've had my American, like when I dress up for a wedding, and I wear my traditional lace, I mean, these styles are quite amazing, and I've had my American friends just literally fall off the chair because, oh my God, this is a lot, you know? So if I'm trying to market to someone like my friend, I have to study uh, what they like. So I think we, we did a lot of research to understand what is, the, what, what is that elegance, what is that class, what is that appeal, what kind of fabrics are those fabrics that appeal to who we want to appeal to. So my advice is it doesn't matter what you want to do, you really should... And this is not really an academic exercise. There's Google. You can Google what it is that you're trying to do and say and try to find out who else is doing it. And it's okay if somebody else is doing it. Maybe that means you have to go back to the drawing table and figure out how do I make it a little different. You know, if it's a if you're trying to come out with a, a, a teacup, am I going to add a second handle to it? Am I going to show mm -hmm. these fabrics like with this yeah. video? Yeah. Yeah. To explain. That's okay. I the fabric? I should, yeah, like, you know, to really show. This show, is the chiffon. Yeah, showcase the. Uh, I if I showed you chiffon. Mm, this is chiffon. Yeah. And what we've done when we sewed it was to take this and put under it. Let me see. Look at that. Amazing. It just gives it this, Amazing. this beautiful shine. I have, I have really never seen when it comes to African print on sequence before. This never. is I've never first really time. seen. This is the first time I'm seeing African print with um with sequins, mm -hmm. which is really uh, a beautiful thing to see. It's the glow. The, I mean, this is you know we've had designs where we just put the sequin here and the, the rest of the dress was um this, and it just takes that dress to a different level. And um, this is your chiffon, and chiffon is always playful. Like it's soft, mm -hmm. so it can you can, it can. You see, when you wear it, it can, for a little girl, it's loose, it's soft, and the designs fall. There's certain things that when you do it with cotton, it's not really going to fall, but this does that. And what we've done in terms of to add a little glam to it is, you take this gorgeous, shiny fabric, and instead of using, like, the normal just, cotton to yeah, line it, yeah. we use this to line this fabric, and it just goes from... A regular chiffon to just this gorgeous shine under it that Thank reflects. You. That's just so elegant and beautiful. Very beautiful. And, and I remember um, this this horse, right? Yes. I remember growing this. up. Growing up. <laughs> you know, it's always a, it was always rapper in all the yeah. seeing it in a, in a new light. It's something different and I think the color has a lot to do with that as well because Absolutely. I think there are certain colors that you're used to seeing in Ankara. Like we're very notorious for the reds and the yellows and, and the blues and the blues and like this is lime right here, like yeah. neon. Mixing that with fuchsia, who would ever do that? This is like no. a no no. But it really did work for us to um to do this. And the most beautiful thing right now is when you see all these music videos, mm -hmm. um, yeah, especially the superstars in Africa mm -hmm. using our cars, um, their trousers and making yes, paints out of yes, trousers yes, and all that. Yes. So it's like Accra came all the way back again and yes. making yes. this new debut. Yes. And you are part of the people making this happen. In 
diaspora yeah. right now. Yeah, we're focusing on children, so there has to be somebody taking care of the kids, and <laughs> I'm the nanny for that. Like, I'm, I'm glad to take that role and let you guys do all the adulty stuff. But... And you're the nanny for taking the checks in as well. <sighs> Because you can't just be a nanny and work for nothing just to take in the checks in. Uh, that's a good one. <laughs> I don't have any response to that. <laughs> when it comes to the checks, when it comes to the checks, you are not even job. You are not even saying you, you don't want to say anything. But we're very generous. Like, we are very generous with, with you know, the success that we've had. We've uh, partnered with... Uh, a lot of uh, girl advocate uh, groups in Africa. We donate dresses for kids that are, get cleaned up in the streets. And, you know, when we launched and this started happening, one of the biggest things that we saw was just organizations emailing us saying, just like, you know, you, you mentioned when you called me on the phone, we love what you're doing. How can you partner with us? This is what we do. We work with little girls and, you know, we make them look pretty. And we thought, you know, and Kara looking pretty on an African girl versus buying her like, you know, a dress, you know, that is just 100% all Western. This is beautiful. And we've really uh, said yes to those organizations to say, we'll, we'll donate four or five dresses uh, for you during Easter or Christmas and have your girls uh, wear it. So that's been, um, you know, this other little girl who, uh, she emailed me because she got bullied a lot in school and she came out with a t-shirt line that uh, literally has all these inspirational words uh, to kids like be strong, you're, you're who you are, you're beautiful. And uh, she was going for the launch of her, um, her t-shirt uh, in Dominican Republic and she emailed and said, I love your dresses. I don't know that we can afford it, but could you help what we're doing? And we've just opened our doors to those kinds of uh, efforts to, to support little girls that are really doing things, not just in Africa, but they're just good kids here who really have a good heart and doing great things. And we say, hey, you can, you can come, come have whatever you want to have and just keep doing what you're doing. So I, when it, when it comes to charity, giving back, um, this is, this is one of the reasons I do this mm -hmm. because, um, Giving back is what we do. Mm -hmm. We're trying to be the voice for the voiceless in not just Africa, yeah. every child that is Everywhere. living under the shadow. Everywhere. And when when I hear you talk about how you're giving back to those kids, mm -hmm. normally um, don't even can't even afford to eat. Mm -hmm. Not to even talk about mm -hmm. having a dress for Christmas. Yeah. You know, That's... this is a big deal because I know when it comes to Christmas, African mm -hmm. fabric, mm -hmm. our mothers use use mm -hmm. this to dress us up, you know. Mm -hmm. So Christmas I just want to say thank you so mm -hmm. much and keep um, doing the amazing work that you're doing. This is why I said you're our inspirational <laughs> woman this week, this month. So thank you so much. So is there any other... Um, charities or out there if they want to reach you if anybody want to reach you or want to you if, know buy the your material if, fabric if, if there is i mean we're we're open to really hearing uh what everybody's doing out there i mean there are great people doing great work and we are very open to hearing that please email me uh info at shellsbellskids.com um you can go to our facebook uh which is facebook.com slash shellsbellskids and send me a facebook message you can instagram me i'm very uh, prolific on social media thanks to shells bells kids <laughs> uh our instagram uh, name is shells niger you can go on our twitter which is S Bells Kids, and we, one thing that I am very particular about is being responsive, and this is something that I shared with my team members. I, I hate when you send an email and it goes into a black hole. Like I try to imagine this kind of bottomless black hole that emails kind of fall through, and that's something that we say we are never going to tolerate in our organization. So email us, let us know what you're doing, let us know how we can partner with you. Our vision is beyond business. Our vision, part of what we're doing here today with you is part of our vision to share what we've done well because we've heard other people share what they've done well. We've copied people and if, if you know, if there's anything today that we've discussed that you wanted to hear more information about, feel free uh, to uh, contact us at info at shellsbellskids.com. Reasons that I wanted to uh, talk to you is that I never want to forget where I came from, okay? I want to be able to give back, whether it be in form of knowledge or be in form of charity, what we're doing here and what has worked. And um, I really want to say that that's, that's really extremely important. That's how we empower these women, by talking about it, not by hiding it. Yes. And 
not just talking about it, but also talking about it in the right context uh, to the right audience, right? So I, I do know that personally, I could tell you that uh, women already feel challenged globally. Being an African woman, it's a, a, a double layer of, 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 just, yeah. of challenge. Yeah. So we know that, and to have this kinds of avenue where we can share our views, I can tell you, this is how I, this is what I was thinking about, this is how I brought it into actualization, and I'm being very honest to say, these are the challenges that we face. These are the challenges that we continue to face. This is how we've survived. We're still surviving. We haven't even survived yet. I might wake up tomorrow and get a call from somebody that said, oh, I, I placed the order for 200 dresses. Eh, I'm sorry. You know, so how do you deal with that as well? So the success is not a one way. It's like success, hiccup, success, hiccup, but your character is what really uh, allows you to kind of stay on that bumpy, bumpy ride. So what you're doing here is part of that effort to empower people. Like when you look at me and you go like, oh, hmm, she's Nigerian, she's African, yeah. she's this, she's that, and she did that. I think I can do it. And uh, so thank you. Thank you. And I hope all the young girls, all the young boys, you don't have to be African. No <laughs> you don't have to be African to make something out of yourself. Wherever you are, whatever you put your mind to, whatever you want to do, you can absolutely do it. Shazie, she's from a, from a little town in Africa, in Nigeria. She has been able to come to America, actualize her dream, her goal, and she's making it happen every day. And we just encourage, we, we're telling you to get up. This is a, a lesson that we all have to learn that we need to always work hard. We cannot rely on one thing. When one thing fails, you get back up again and start all over again. And we just want to say, um, we hope this woman right here, I call her my friend, I hope her story inspire you to do something for yourself and for your family. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oman. Baby, it's been a long, long time. I heard you were back in the village. Will you stay for a little while? I missed you, baby. I've been longing for